This video continues our tour of the Kickstarter for preemption. In the last video, we learned the facts of Hillman versus Moretta, and we looked at the express preemption provision in that federal statute. This video looks at the options for implied preemption. One type of conflict that would invalidate a state law is usually called impossibility, although it's sometimes called a direct conflict. The impossibility concept is designed to protect individuals from getting caught in a catch-22, where no matter what they do, they would be violating either a state law or a federal law. The most obvious sort of impossibility would arise if one law required a person to do something that the other law forbids, such as a federal law requiring people to carry guns with them at all times, and a state law making it illegal for people to carry guns on them at any time. No matter what people chose to do with regard to the guns, they'd be breaking some law, either the federal one or the state one. A less dramatic example of impossibility arises if there are irreconcilable provisions in laws that regulate the manner of doing something that is otherwise legal. For example, a state law might require a certain product to be sold in a red box, while Congress requires it to be sold in a green box. Selling the product is supposed to be legal under both laws, but these differences make for an impossible situation. Once again, people who obey one law are, by definition, violating the other. In Hillman, let's consider each individual to see whether they are placed in an impossible situation. Start with the insurance company. There's really no impossibility here. The insurer can follow federal law by sending the money to Judy. It doesn't violate state law when it does this. The state law says nothing about the insurance company. There's no impossibility for Judy. Federal law doesn't require her to do anything in particular. To be sure, Judy will be unhappy if the state law takes the money away from her, but that doesn't mean Judy is being forced to violate federal law when she obeys state law. Judy is in an undesirable situation, but it's not an impossible situation where she is forced to either break one law or the other. And the same goes for Jacqueline. If she uses state law to get money from Judy, she is not herself violating any federal law. By and large, impossibility preemption is fairly rare. Obstacle preemption is much more common. As we just saw, the purpose of impossibility preemption is to protect individuals. By contrast, the purpose of obstacle preemption is to protect the federal government, and specifically the federal government's ability to pursue its policies without being undercut by state laws. Under obstacle preemption, we first try to figure out the purpose of the federal law. The purpose might not be expressly stated in the statute, so courts have to read between the lines. Also, a federal law might serve more than one purpose. Next, we act if the state law acts as an obstacle to accomplishing the federal purpose. Not every little difference between state and federal law amounts to an obstacle. We're looking for significant obstacles that could realistically hinder the federal goal. In Hillman, the Supreme Court identified several purposes behind the federal law. One was to establish clarity about who should receive the insurance benefits. Another was to respect the instructions that the employee had given in writing. And another was to give the listed beneficiary an actual entitlement to that money. So now let's consider whether the Virginia law poses a significant obstacle to any of these purposes. The state law doesn't really pose an obstacle to the first purpose. The insurer can follow federal law, send the benefits to the listed person, and we've got our clarity. There is an obstacle to the second purpose, because the money is not ultimately being distributed according to the written instructions. And there is absolutely a conflict with the third purpose, because the listed beneficiary is deprived of money that Congress wanted them to have. So this is a crystal clear example of obstacle preemption. Finally, we can consider if the state law was enacted within a field that Congress had effectively claimed for itself. 
As we saw in the last video, Congress actually made clear in the statute that it did not want to completely occupy the field of group life insurance. State laws are preempted under this statute only to the extent they are inconsistent. So there is no express field preemption. For educational purposes, though, let's imagine that we don't have this statute at all. Instead, we have to decide, based on the remainder of the statute, whether Congress implied a desire to occupy the field. For field preemption, we can imagine some topic for legislation. In this case, the topic is life insurance. Conceivably, Congress could want complete uniformity and complete control over all the lawmaking in that field. That would mean that state laws falling in that field would be preempted, even if they aren't creating impossibility, and even if they were not obstacles to federal goals. If there is field preemption, any non-federal law is considered preempted, and that's because one of Congress's goals is to have complete federal authority in the field with no competing state laws whatsoever. Now, the best way for field preemption to occur is for Congress to post our hypothetical keep out sign in the statute itself. But in a few situations where there is no express field preemption, the courts decide that Congress wanted there to be a sign like this. If the court is convinced that occupying the field is necessary to the implied congressional goals. So is there implied field preemption in our modified version of Hillman? Let's recognize that field preemption serves this implied goal of uniform federal control. When do we think that is an implied goal? The statutes that have been deemed to occupy a field tend to be ones that are very lengthy and comprehensive, and they often regulate an entire big industry. Think about nuclear power, where Congress has detailed statutes and regulations, and a specialized executive branch agency in charge of enforcing them. Or think about aviation, where once again we have very detailed federal regulations and a federal aviation administration to enforce them. So in Hillman, the statute doesn't create a pervasive system of regulation for the entire life insurance industry. We have a relatively short statute dealing with a narrow subject, who's going to be the beneficiary for a federal employee. A congressional desire to occupy the field may also be implied if these pervasive regulations are in an area where the federal government has a dominant interest in control. Once again, think about things of national importance like aviation or nuclear power. Life insurance and marital property haven't been areas where the federal government has ever claimed a dominant interest. To the contrary, most insurance law and most family law is handled at the state level. So overall, the statute in Hillman is too narrow to be something that impliedly occupies an entire field. Because the law doesn't occupy a field, we don't have to go on to the second question of asking whether the state law is actually in that field or not. So overall, this is a case where Congress's aims will be protected through the narrower doctrine of obstacle preemption and not the sweeping doctrine of field preemption.